The Second Amendment protects the right to keep and bear arms. But should the government ever be able to violate that right for a really important reason? Well, today we're going to look at a made-up legal doctrine known as the Tears of Scrutiny, which some federal courts have applied to uphold challenged gun control laws under the Second Amendment. Hey folks, I'm Mark and welcome to the Four Boxes Diner. The Second Amendment says that the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Based on that language, you might think that the government cannot enact restrictions on your right to keep and bear arms, period. But wait just a moment. According to many federal courts, you'd be dead wrong. And why is that? Well, these courts apply an invented legal doctrine known as the tears of scrutiny to balance away your constitutional rights, including the right to keep and bear arms, even though these laws infringe on the right to keep and bear arms. So how does this work? Well, under the tears of scrutiny doctrine, if you go to court and claim that some gun control law is unconstitutional, the court will apply one of three standards or tiers, if you will, of scrutiny to assess your claim. If your claim is based on certain constitutional rights that liberal judges love, then the court will apply what is called strict scrutiny. Now, this is seen as a very protective standard of individual rights, and the government's law will be struck down unless the government can show that the law somehow is necessary to serve a compelling or highly important purpose. But as a practical matter, if strict scrutiny is applied, to the law, it's going to be struck down. For example, if they apply strict scrutiny, which they do to First Amendment free speech rights, then those laws that infringe on that will almost always be struck down as unconstitutional under the First Amendment. Okay, now for other rights, the courts will often apply something called intermediate scrutiny intermediate scrutiny. Now this standard is less stringent than strict scrutiny, but it still offers, at least in theory, some protection of individual rights against government encroachment. For all other rights though, the court will apply what is called a rational basis review, the lowest level of review or standard, and the easiest one for the government to meet. Now, rational basis means that the court is going to uphold the challenged law unless you could somehow show that the law is completely and utterly irrational. The bottom line is, if the court applies this rational basis standard, the government, frankly, is going to win the case, and the law that's being challenged will be upheld. Now, this is the standard that usually applies to taking away your property or your economic rights, by the way. Again, we may talk about that in a later video, but for now, just understand that's what that's about. Now, I want to look more closely at this dangerous legal doctrine, the doctrine of tears. Of scrutiny. At the beginning of our country, courts did not apply this scrutiny doctrine. For the first several decades after the U.S. Constitution was adopted, if someone challenged a law as unconstitutional, well, the courts then would look at the constitutional provisions text and then try to figure out what it meant. If the provision was inconsistent with the challenged law, the court would strike down that law because if there's an inconsistency between the U.S. Constitution and some other law, the U.S. Constitution always prevails. It wasn't until the 20th century, well over 100 years after the Constitution was adopted, that the courts developed this theory of tiers of scrutiny. Now, the first case to use strict scrutiny as a standard, for example, was decided in 1963. That's 1963 by the Supreme Court. And that case involved free speech and the First Amendment. The Supreme Court was worried that too many laws violated the correct understanding of the First Amendment, so it needed to come up with a doctrine that gave the government an escape hatch. In other words, it needed to come up with a way for the government to be able to restrict free speech when it claimed it had a really, really important reason 
for doing so. Now, the fact that this was the rationale behind the tiers of scrutiny doctrine alone, right? This should be, uh, this should give us a pause and make us really suspicious of the tiers of scrutiny doctrine in and of itself. But there was another problem with the tiers of scrutiny that we should be worried about. And that problem with the tiers of scrutiny approach is that it basically gives judges judges, often unelected officials, right, judges, a blank check to follow their own policy preferences rather than the written constitution and the written Bill of Rights itself. And that's not a good idea. So in a constitutional challenge, how do these tiers of scrutiny get applied? Well, first what happens is the courts ask whether the government has argued that the challenged law is really important, that it advances some important public policy purpose, okay? But this question really is entirely subjective, right? There's no real way to figure out whether the purpose relied on by the government is important enough. And the government can always just assert that they are acting, of course, for public health and public safety. They can just assert it. So second, the court then tries to figure out whether the challenge law actually does a good enough job of furthering the government's claimed goal or purpose. Does it really work? But again, this requires a series of judgment calls by the courts. In most cases, both sides will be able to claim that the law does or does not serve the government's interest well enough or effectively. So a judge's decision usually could go with one side rather than the other. It's very subjective and really in the eyes of the beholder. In this case, the eyes of a judge. Now, the result of this is that judges will pay near lip service to enforcing the actual text of the Constitution. Instead, they're simply going to enforce the constitutional rights that they like, and they will ignore and not enforce the ones that they don't like. And then the courts will use this tiers of scrutiny doctrine or theory to dress up their political decision as being according to law. But I'm going to give you some good news if you like the Second Amendment. And the good news is that those judges who like to use tiers of scrutiny to cut back on our constitutional rights have a problem. Because what's going to happen in this Supreme Court case of NYSERPA, or New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, is that the Supreme Court's going to have an opportunity this time to crack down on the dangerous tiers of scrutiny doctrine. This is probably going to happen, by the way, and we'll talk more about this in other videos. The lower courts have applied tiers of scrutiny in Second Amendment cases for the last decade, but the Supreme Court itself has never done so. In fact, in 2008, when it decided the District of Columbia versus Heller case, the Supreme Court actually said that the tiers of scrutiny doctrine did not apply to Second Amendment cases. In fact, here is the key language from Justice Scalia's opinion in Heller when he explained that you cannot balance away our Second Amendment rights to keep and bear arms. Scalia wrote, and these are his words, not mine. They're very powerful and they're important for you to hear this. This is Scalia. Scalia said, we know of no other enumerated constitutional right whose core protection has been subjected to a freestanding interest balancing approach. The very enumeration of the right takes out of the hands of government, even the hands of the third branch of government, that's the courts, by the way, the power to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether the right is really worth insisting upon. A constitutional guarantee subject to future judges' assessments of its usefulness is no constitutional guarantee at all. Constitutional rights are enshrined with the scope they were understood to have when the people adopted them, whether or not legislatures or, yes, even future judges think that that scope is too broad. That is very powerful language from the late Justice Scalia and the Supreme Court in Heller. So hopefully the current Supreme Court will reaffirm this critical point. After all, Heller said that courts should enforce the Second Amendment the old-fashioned way by trying to figure out from the amendment's language and from its history what it actually means, and then striking down any laws that violate the meaning of the Second Amendment. 
Let's hope the Supreme Court rejects the tiers of scrutiny in the Second Amendment context. We do not need to give judges an excuse to balance away our fundamental Second Amendment rights. So let's wrap up. Today we've looked at the legal doctrine known as the tiers of scrutiny. We've talked about how the doctrine started in the 1960s as a way for courts to balance away our First Amendment rights. We've also seen that it basically gives judges a license to ignore our fundamental rights if it somehow thinks that the government has a good reason for infringing upon those constitutional rights. And we've also talked about how the Supreme Court has an opportunity right now during this term to set the record straight once and for all and thus reject the use of this doctrine in Second Amendment cases. So thanks for tuning in to the Four Boxes Diner where we serve hot, fresh Second Amendment news and analysis on a daily basis. And if you like what you've heard, please subscribe and spread the news. And we'll see you next time at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up, table 2A.